Uh, thank you for coming to this event this evening. Uh, my name's Nick Jennings, and I'm the, provost, the Vice Provost for Research and Enterprise here at Imperial College London. This is a, a great opportunity to, to hear from the government's chief scientific advisor about his insights and his experience of the role of science in policy making and, and how science and policy can influence one another for, for mutual benefit. So I hope we have a very lively discussion. I hope that means you all have questions. Uh, Patrick's going to provide us with the, with the answers, hopefully. Um, uh, and so uh, please think of your questions. Please be active about this. So what we're having is a, is a session uh, here in here first, where Patrick and Professor Mary Ryan, who is our Vice Dean for, for Research in the, in the Faculty of Engineering, are going to have a conversation involving, involving the audience. And then what we're going to do is we're then decanting to the foyer, which is where many of you might come in, uh, where we're going to do the formal opening of the forum, which is the purpose of get, gathering tonight. So just a few housekeeping things. There are four fire escapes. There are two at the back and two at the side. They sort of all loop round and mainly take you out the, the front door where many of you will have come in. Um, so please think of your questions. Please engage uh, with, the, with the session. Mary, thank you very much. Hey, come on. Ma magic. Um, so thank you very much for coming. We're, we're very um, happy that you're here to Pleasure. talk to us. A couple of brief, I guess, ground rules. One, Patrick has indicated that there are no off-limit questions, so... I'm that saying, I'm saying, them I'm all, saying that with caution. Um, and, and the second thing is just to, just to reiterate that Patrick is, you know, an advisor to the government, but he's not responsible for policy. So... Um, so, so just bear that in mind when you're actually formulating your questions. Um, and just to add to that, just to be clear, I am a civil servant, non-political appointment. Yeah. So that's really important. Okay. Um, and so this is going to be a discussion. I'd like it to be a discussion between all of us. Um, I'm, we're going to try and curate the questions a little bit. So if you have a question, rather than jumping straight to the next person, if there's anybody that wants to follow up, we're going to try and enable that. Bear in mind that's quite difficult in such a big room, but let's see if we can do it. Um, and so before I come to the room, I'd just like, maybe if you could just give us an overview of your role as yeah, sure. CSA in the role so, in general. Um, the government chief scientific advisor role actually uh, um, arose after the Second World War when I think the government had realised that science and technology had been rather important in terms of the war. And somebody thought, well, maybe it's going to be important during peacetime as well. So the role arose out of that. Um, the description of the role is to give advice to the Prime Minister and Cabinet on all aspects of science and to try and ensure that policy is informed by evidence and that science can be embedded in that process. So it's quite a broad remit and of course you know, it, it's impossible to do that in its totality but that's the role and I'm supported in that by the fact that we have Chief Scientific Advisors now in most departments, nearly all departments, have a chief scientific advisor. So there is a network of chief scientific advisors across government as well um, that allows us to sort of get the coverage um, uh, uh, into different departments and, of course, provides a resource in terms of different expertise that can come together to answer questions. Okay, thank you. And I think I'm going to hand over to the room. Is there anyone who would like to be the first questioner? Okay, yeah. No, or somewhere else, that's also fine. Yeah. No pressure being the first of all. Um, so we are, as we all know, about to get a new Prime Minister. Um, could I ask Sir Patrick what you would say to the PM um, about to move into Downing Street um, it should be his science priorities? Well, uh, I, I mean, the first thing to say is, of course, you know, the new Prime Minister is going to be completely consumed with all sorts of other things. So my priority is actually to make sure that whoever it is whichever one gets it, they understand that they need to be thinking hard about science and technology. So my aim at the moment is to ensure that early on we get something to the Prime Minister that allows him to understand where science and technology can be helpful to him. All politicians understand where science and technology becomes useful during an emergency. So you know, when you've got something like an Ebola crisis or Novichok or... Um, flooding or drones, 
there's suddenly a huge interest in science advice because that underpins the response. What I want to do with the new Prime Minister is to get something to that person. I don't want to have a disaster to do it, mm. but I want to get something early to get that person interested in science so we can open the door and start having conversation about how science and technology can be helpful to thinking about policy formulation and what that person may do. So I'm not going to say now that there are specific things that I'm going to go in and ask for, but I definitely want to do that because if we get that right, then that opens the door for all sorts of things right through the tenure of that person's role as Prime Minister. So but what's the strategy for doing that? How well, the strategy for doing that is, I, I mean, the first thing is that, that, that you know, whoever it is is going to be bombarded with people mm -hmm. wanting to get information to them. Yeah. So there's something uh, about making sure you've got the right contacts in the right mm -hmm. places to get something in front of the Prime mm -hmm. Minister. And so I'm spending time actually making sure that we've got that bit right and um, making sure that we know who advisors might be that we can um, try and... Try and um, get hold of as well uh, and then there'll be a letter which will go to the Prime Minister which will outline mm -hmm. some of the things that I think could be helpful and why they need to know about it and it seems to me you know absolutely the case self-evidently true that nearly all of the opportunities and the threats that any government faces have a strong science mm -hmm. and technology theme running through them um, the post brexit um, UK has got to have a strong international mm -hmm. science and technology um, foundation. It's got, we've got to be international in what we do. Um, and we've got to make sure that we are able to translate our world-class science. And you know, whichever way you look at it, we are absolutely world-class at science. We've got to be world-class at turning that into innovation and societal mm -hmm. benefit. And so, you know, those, those are sort of the things mm -hmm. that need to be there. But, but, but the last thing I think the Prime Minister wants to read in the first week is some sort of worthy five-page lecture on, on, mm -hmm. on the importance of science and technology. It's got to be embedded in, you know, here are a couple of things that mm -hmm. you could actually do now to open the door. Okay. There was a question in the middle here. Uh. In respect of the uh, medical disorder, ME chronic fatigue syndrome, which affects about 200,000 people in this country, um, there is a sort of philosophical fault line uh, which runs through the medical profession, on one side of which are people, um, and I'm afraid they're in the majority, who think that this has a purely psychological basis. On the other side of that fault line are people like myself, I would admit, who think it has a physical basis. I'd be very intrigued to know which side of that fault line you are. <laughs> Good. Can we come back to that specific question, but maybe more generally ask you how you approach when there's a divergence of opinion in the scientific community, what's your approach in how you inform government, and then maybe you could ask, yeah. answer the specific question. Well, I mean, the first thing is, it, it's a ma one of the things that, that, that I've learned, and it's obvious, but it's mm -hmm. worth um, restating, is it, it's very seldom the case that science is absolutely mm -hmm. black or white. I mean, most of the time, there is a knowledge base we have today, mm -hmm. and that has caveats, it has uncertainties, it has assumptions underlying it as well. And the worst thing I think we can do as science advisors is to go into politicians and say, the answer is this, undoubtedly. Now, there are some cases when you do need to do that, but more often than not, it's about setting out the scene, saying, here's the evidence base as of today. This is what the science is telling us. This is why we believe this is the case. These are the assumptions that underlie that. Here are the caveats. And by the way, this is a sort of time frame on which mm -hmm. you might expect some more information mm -hmm. on this. And on that basis, politicians can then make decisions. And, and it's, it's politicians that have to make decisions. What science advisors can do is make sure they've got the right information to do it and the options that might flow from decisions mm -hmm. that they take. So I think that um, framing of uncertainty mm -hmm. is really an important part of the role. And, uh, and we do science a massive disservice when we present something as an absolute truth and then you know, a year later it's completely overturned <coughs> and politicians think, well, that means I don't need to believe anything. Mm -hmm. And so I think that framing of uncertainty is key. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in this particular um, example, and I think um, an ex-head um, of the medical school here, I think, ha had some work done on this. Um, Boris, when he was head, I think, did some work here on, on, on this area. And I think it's a, it, it is a genuine unknown here, actually. That um, there is, I mean, the first thing I would challenge is whether there's a single syndrome or whether it's actually a constellation of different things. So I think the syndrome definition is difficult. Do I believe that within that syndrome definition, there are people who've got something which has some physical underlying property, which could be viral, it could be something else? Yeah, there will be people in that who have that, and, and we know that. 
Um, do I believe that there are also people in what's currently defined as a syndrome who have a predominantly psychological part? Yes, I believe that too. So I think we've got very ill definition of the syndrome. We've got very uh, little in the way of good science that starts to dissect that out properly. I think there's lots more to be done if we're going to start talking about spe specificity of disease in that particular, particular case. And it's not alone, by the way. It's true for other diseases as well. Okay. Any particular follow-up on that? and uncertainty in presentation in general. No, if not, I think there's one down here. Hello. Yeah, it's coming the other way. Uh, thank you, and thanks for your time and, and being here. I'm sure you're very busy. Um, so my question is around your, your scope. I'm um, currently completing a PhD in the Department of Design Engineering, um, which is perhaps less, if I look at the list of things like AI, air quality, data, and so on, they're quite hard things but around uh, behavior change, yeah. um, more kind of designing the, the human experience, and I'm just interested in where that fits in the total picture um, and how you might advise, say, a group like, like ours to be, become more involved. Yeah, so um, my remit covers a, the breadth of science with a broad definition of science. It's definitely not just the physical sciences or, 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 or that side of things. So uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in th there's a group called the Scientific Advice for Government Emergencies, which is, convenes at times of national emergencies with an aim to give single science advice into COBRA, which is the government machine. J for those of you who don't know, COBRA always sounds terribly sort of exciting as though it's got some big code name. It actually stands for Cabinet Office Briefing Room A. <laughs> it's, th it's that boring. But anyway, that's where the committee meets. And um, SAGE feeds into that. And what's absolutely clear is that in every time SAGE has met since I've been in post, we've had behavioural scientists around the table, we've had anthropologists, we've had others. Because if you start to view these problems as simple technological ones or hard science only, you miss a big opportunity to actually uh, create influence and get this right. So, for example, in the Fukushima disaster from years ago, it's estimated more people died from the reaction to how people behave than got um, illness from actually radiation. And so uh, behavioural science in particular is a big area that we're trying to look at. There's quite a few behavioural scientists dotted around government. We're looking at the moment about what we can do in the Government Office for Science to be a bit more of a home to try and stimulate that. Um, so first answer to the question is yes, that's definitely part of the remit. Um, and second is, you know, how might a group like yours get more involved? I mean, there are a number of ways in which, um, in which uh, academics uh, and, and indeed industrial scientists um, can get involved in, 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 in this, ranging from, you know, a, a, at a, a junior level, there are internships and so on, when people come in and spend time, some of them funded by um, the research councils, through to advisory committees, and we have advisory committees, and I have round tables all the time when I'm bringing in a diverse group of people, and I'm always looking for people who actually might be good on those advisory committees. Um, so, you know, for example, I had one last week on um, uh, quantum computing. Um, you know, there'll be other topics which are broader than that. Um, we, we have them in emergencies and non-emergencies, so those are good ways to get involved in this. Um, and the thing that government really needs, and I need, um, from science is really good evidence synthesis. You know, it, it's, it's usually not the case that a single piece of work is going to somehow influence government policy. It's much more likely that good synthesis of current knowledge can be incredibly influential because it says this is the state of our knowledge now and this is what should happen. So I think a mindset that says how do we turn the knowledge base into that um, synthesis becomes important and some principles of that good evidence synthesis have been laid out. Um, but I think um, one of the things that, 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 that uh, this, this forum, this network could do here is, of course, make access to that much easier from our side, and that's going to be an important part of it. So I think you know, if, if you want to get involved in that, I'm always out on the lookout for people in other disciplines to say, where can we bring people in, um, not just in emergencies, but, but yeah. for policy as well. Yeah, I think just to follow up on your question, I think you responded how, you know, how behavioural scientists and how people respond to technology, rather than, I think, what you're talking about is how do you design technology so that people respond to it in the way you want them to. So that kind of closed loop of design plus behavioural science plus technology. And so, I guess bringing yeah. you guys into this kind of fora 
will, will help closing that loop. The other thing to say is that the, the, each department has published areas of research interest now, and those areas of research interest, which are not perfect, and that, you know, we're in a process of learning how to get those right, do tell you what departments are interested in now. Now, that there's a bit of a sort of long-term gap there that I want to try and plug, but they do tell us, and, and, and those provide good ways in to say, well, actually, if that's what you're interested in, I, I, I can help, or my discipline can help, or uh, the research we're doing might help, so that's quite a good way in, and, and we're just, as of today, actually launching a new process to try and get um, a, a two academics to come into a uh, government office for science, funded by ESRC, to try to look at how we take the problems that departments have got and create better use of the ARI documents to link back into academic groups. Just as a rough show of hands, how many people in this room are have aware of or read any of the areas of research interest that are published on the government website? Oh, not too bad. About 25, 30%? Okay, well, um, Amanda's going to circulate those links so that you can all enjoy the read. Um, I think there was one lady there on your side. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Belinda Gordon from the environmental think tank Green Alliance. Um, I want to ask a topic-related question, but I guess it has, more, it has broader implications because it's about the sort of boundary or the grey area between science and policy and politics. So given the uh, Climate Change Committee's report today, which showed that we're way off track to meeting even our previous uh, uh, carbon reduction target of 80%, what role do scientists, either within government or outside government, have in ensuring that not only we have the right targets and science-based targets, but that we're actually taking the action to meet them? Yeah, I think it's critical. And, and I think, first of all, I mean, as you alluded to, scientists have been absolutely influential in making that happen, actually. I think that is a, a, a sort of, you know, albeit late, but I mean, there's a scientific success story in terms of that is firmly on the government's um, agenda. The net zero target is the right thing to go for. The challenge, as you rightly say, is how to turn that into integrated systematic action. And um, one of the things I think scientists can do in this, and I think systems engineers are going to be particularly important in this, is this is a systems problem. And we run the risk of not meeting this if we tackle each problem individually or try and think you can do that. So, of course, it's true that each problem does need to be tackled, but they need to be done in an integrated way. And most of the challenges around what we need to do to get to net zero do not require invention of new technologies. I mean, most of it is known. Now, there are improvements that could be made, for sure. So it's an implementation and decision and integration problem, and I think that is going to require a lot of scientific thinking and advice for policy as to how you do that in an integrated way. And it's certainly one of the things that, 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 that I want to get very involved in, in, is how we can think of that as a systems problem, and how we also align our innovation agenda to that aim. Because, um, of course, research funding for science needs to have a significant proportion which is blue skies and is undirected and is going you know, wherever it goes. But there's also a proportion which needs to be linked to what the ambition is. And here there's a very clear ambition and we need to make sure that we get that funding linked up with what needs to happen to remove the uncertainties to allow that integrated place. So I think there's a science and there's a systems engineering approach there which needs to be taken. Is, is this related to this? Yeah. yeah. Very much to do, to do with that. Well, Will Pascal, I'm currently the mayor in Kensington, Chelsea, but this has been my field of work over the last 40 years yeah. in central government and also in local government. And the problem, as you've articulated there, is that much of it is known. There was much known back in the 70s. If we put uh, low-grade in insulation in roofs across all the housing stock, we wouldn't be dependent on Russian gas now. And it would have had strategic Im implications apart from the climate change issues. The problem that we have as a local authority is that we don't have the numbers as to where we need to achieve in what sectors. Because, I mean, for instance, if you take the building stock around here, the stock turn on it is about 400 years, so you can't go down that route. Yeah. You've got to go down a, some parallel um, remediation route to, to, to do it. But unless we have the numbers titrated over time, 
with targets in the next five years, ten years, and so on, we won't be able physically to achieve those targets. Now, having some scientific input to put numbers on a Gantt chart, which give us intermediary targets to aim for, um, would greatly assist. I agree with that, and, and I think you know the Royal Academy of Engineering wrote a good report, actually stimulated through the Council for Science and Technology and, and Government Office for Science on this a few years ago, and, 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 and we're in the process of working to update that with them and think about whether we can get to numbers. But for example, to your point, um, th at that point they said there are, there are three generations of cars, if you like, to get to the, um, to, and there's 2040 in, that, in, in that, that case, and there are two generations of boilers in houses that you think of. So you know, those are the sorts of things you need to know in order to say, how can I plan, therefore, to make this transition? And the other thing I'd highlight is David Mackay, who was the chief scientific advisor at Bayes, or what was then DEC, um, before he sadly passed away early, I mean, did a brilliant thing which is still available, which is, the, which is at a more personal level, the calculator to say what you need to do as an individual on this. And I think though, making this numerical, making it evidence-based, and being clear about this as a system, I think, is what we now need to get our hands around quickly in order to allow people to start making, and organisations to make the right decisions. But, but those systems need to be financially enabled by government incentives, or the way the government yeah, plans sure. incentives. So how do you, I mean, it's, it's, it seems difficult for us where we know there's lots of innovation happened and could be implemented, but financially it's not viable. So how do you get government to enact policies that actually <coughs> enable technologies that can make a big difference in climate change, do that. I mean, and this is, I guess, one of your big challenges, but well, I'm it, curious it, it, to know it, it, what, it, it how those conversations It absolutely is happen. a challenge, and, it's, and, and, and ultimately, of course, that's a very big political challenge mm -hmm. because um, it, it, it's, us, it's us all that's going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you've got to get the political mm -hmm. agenda right to make that acceptable. But this is why I think a systems approach is so important because mm -hmm. in a systems approach, you can also look at the consequences of different pricing in different, mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. areas. Um, if you start treating every innovation and every potential implementation as a single thing, you mm -hmm. can end up with very perverse results mm -hmm. in Indeed. terms of where the cost Indeed. lies. Indeed. So cost is clearly an issue of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'd all be you're lying if we said it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you know, if, if, if um, electric cars, uh, which they won't, but I mean, if electric cars stayed at an £80,000 mm -hmm. um, price yeah. point, you know, we're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And if um, changing your heating system in your house, and heating is one of the big challenges that we need to face in this area, changing your heating system is going to suddenly land you with yeah. a bill of £30,000. Well, you know, there are lots of people who aren't going to be able yeah. to do that, don't want to do it. So I think the, the, the cost bit is a very yeah. key part of It is, of but for example, there have been some perverse decisions, I would argue, around solar, the solar panels, right, that have financially disincentivized people from adopting those technologies. I, know that I'm, I just said nobody's just yeah. a policy, and I've just done it, so... We'll, we'll draw a line under that maybe and move on. Well, no, no but you're right. But I mean, yeah. solar is a good example yeah. because I think in an integrated systems approach, we've got to ask the question, where does mm -hmm. solar fit mm -hmm. in? And, and is that yeah. the thing you mm -hmm. want to spend most mm -hmm. of your subsidies on or not? So yeah. I think that's where science mm -hmm. can really present mm -hmm. th those options to politicians. Yeah. Um, selecting which programs are best to fund is certainly an important decision, but the length of funding can be just as important. Several government-funded programs that are ongoing now will end in March 2021, for example. Is it possible somehow for the UK uh, government to provide longer-term funding for <laughs> projects that are longer than five years? Is that feasible in our lifetime? Uh, it, well, is it absolutely essential? Yes. Therefore, there needs to be a way to make it feasible because I think you know, virtually none of the science we're talking about fits a parliamentary cycle. And it certainly doesn't fit a parliamentary cycle at the moment. Um, so, you know, we've got to have a system to allow spending reviews, to allow big decisions that have impact for long, the long term in order to be able to tackle some of these problems. And I don't have the answer to what the structural approach to that is in terms of government finance but you know one of the things I can do and, and will do during my tenure in this job is to make it clear what are the things that fall into that category that we need to we need to do and I think you know most politicians although they have to think in parliamentary cycles for the obvious reasons don't want to do that if there's a way they could think about a longer term term solution 
And so there are examples. You know, some of the infrastructure that's been funded in the UK is obviously a long-term funding uh, commitment. Uh, and we need to do that carefully in terms of climate change, but in terms of some of the other things we want to do as well. Um, and I think Treasury understands they need to be part of that. It doesn't give you the answer to how we do it. Um, but it, I mean, it has been done. I mean, it's not as though there haven't been long-term uh, funding things. But I think for science, that's critical. And, and, and as when I gave my job description in the beginning, it said long-term. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the, this role. Okay. I think at the back first, yeah, on the left. Yeah. And then. Thank you. It's really interesting. Um, my name's Angela Ahuja. I write for the Financial Times on science. Um, and I had two general questions. Um, the first is, uh, right at the beginning, you said that you didn't want to come into your job offering a kind of long-worthy treatise on, on the, you know, how great science and technology is, but you wanted to um, get the government up to speed with a couple of issues. And I wanted to know what are those couple of issues that are perhaps flying under the radar at the moment? Um, and the second one was, um, you are a senior civil servant and having a good relationship with the government often means being frank and honest and giving unvarnished advice. Um, we have seen today what's happened with a senior civil servant that's done just yeah. that and I wanted to get your opinion on, on what's happened and whether you feel confident that you can do, uh, you can fulfil your duties. Thanks. Well, I'll answer the last one first. I feel totally confident I can perform my duties because what's the worst thing they can do? Sack me. I mean, you know, m my job is to give, give direct advice to government on these things and to make that as evidence-based as possible. It's much easier if you are in a position where you have a good relationship across the civil service and across government to do that. Um, that's been the tenor of the uh, role and that's what other people have managed to do and that's what should happen and I think um, my experience so far has been senior politicians not just Prime Minister but other um, senior politicians turn to me and turn to the Government Office of Science when they genuinely want an independent view of things because they want to hear what the evidence is and they want to know what the unvarnished truth is on these things. Now, it doesn't mean that they have to then take that and make that decision. They're elected to make decisions which they can choose to ignore the evidence on, and that must be the case. Now, my job is to try to make sure that doesn't happen and to make sure the evidence is clearly presented and to make sure the consequences of ignoring evidence are clear. But I think I, I'm not worried about that issue of speaking scientific truth to power. Um, sorry, the first question was on... Um, what are your two topics that are... Yes. Oh, OK. Well, I'm not going to tell you, um, because, uh, <laughs> because I think it's important that I have a, you know, the ability to speak directly to the Prime Minister mm -hmm. in confidence about mm -hmm. things. And, you know, I, I don't know yet exactly... I, first of all, I don't know who's going to be the Prime Minister. I don't know what they're likely to be interested in. Uh, my job is to try and get things to the Prime Minister that's likely to be useful to them. You know, I don't want to go in with something that's impossible. Uh, and I want to go in with something that is, you know, interesting enough to have my primary aim, which is to ensure that the next Prime Minister un really understands where science and technology can help them in their thinking and why independent scientific advice is an important part of policy making. Thanks. Okay, so this lady down here. Hi, I'm a master's student here doing science communication, so this is very interesting. Um, how do you balance the responsibility for making change um, between the individual and the government and industry and wider, uh, wider society? And the reason I ask that is that um, I'm looking into obesity at the moment, and the government's uh, foresight report in 2007 um, painted a very complex picture of what causes obesity. And they, in fact, they coined the term, an obe we, we live in an obesogenic environment. And yet, and, and they likened the solutions to it to, to being as complex as, as climate change. So you know, very you know, complex. Um, and yet, almost all the government's policy to tackle obesity has been about empowering or educating or encouraging individuals to make healthier choices and all the rest of it. So you know, the responsibility comes back on the individuals in society. 
And that's happening with climate change. Oh, we've got to change our heating systems. We've got to not use straws, etc., etc. So there's a disconnect there. Um, and I just wonder how you see your role in, in balancing where the responsibility lies between individuals and, and industry. Because certainly in neoliberal society, the, the responsibility tends to sit with the individual, and yet there's much, much more complex uh, well, risks uh, for things. So, so my job is, again, to try and present evidence, and that report on obesity actually came from the Government Office for Science, and we're in the presence of up, updating bits of that at the moment. But... Um, there's an evidence base to answer the question that you've just asked, which is, you know, there are some cases when you know that it's a much more difficult job to get behavioural change in a population than it is to have some tax or something else or some regulation that forces something. And so I think part of the science base is to look at things beyond just the sort of, here's the problem but come up with the science of potential solutions as well. And politicians are like the rest of us. They quite like solutions. They don't just want to be told that there's a big problem out there. And um, I think climate change and behavioural um, um, change as well is, is another good example. We're actually probably the biggest behavioural change that we're seeing in the UK has probably been driven by a 15-year-old girl, not by, not by government. Um, and so, you know, most government interventions around behavioural change are very difficult to get traction. Um, and therefore, you need a mixture of what the behavioural incentives are. And there's a unit in government which, you know, specialises in trying to get behavioural change going, the nudge unit and, and the behavioural insights group. So that does certain things. But I think it's absolutely the case, and there's lots of evidence, and lots of times, that regulation and tax are other ways in which you get... Um, big changes, and those are the levers that government's got, and those are political choices, but they can be informed by evidence. Okay. Is this a follow-up to that question, or a different question? Okay, then it's you. You. That's fine. Yeah. That's a different question, if you don't mind. Um, what, if anything, is your role as Chief Scientific Advisor with regards to Brexit, and does your role as an independent and objective advisor involve advising the future Prime Minister on consequences of a no-deal exit? Uh, well, so we've definitely looked at um, what the um, potential impacts on science are of, of Brexit, both in terms of um, uh, the effect of the science base, but also in terms of things like the importance of um, immigration policy to be right, to, to keep um, supporting you know, the flourishing science base we've got. And we've looked at things like what the potential consequences, I mean, the whole of the civil service is looking at the consequences of potential no deal, what that would affect, and some of those things are scientific. So, uh, yes, there are uh, absolutely Brexit-related elements to it, and um, uh, trying to make sure that the science of that is clear so that people understand the consequences of decisions and actions they wish to take. Could I, can I maybe follow up on that? Because one of the concerns amongst the academic community is that the European funding model funds a lot of our blue skies yeah. underpinning research, and that if that is, is lost to the community, it won't be replaced like for like, that a lot of government new money is going into, into challenge-led research. And so is there any reassurance that you can give the community, or how is how are government being informed about this particular aspect? Yeah, so, I mean, I should be absolutely clear that my job is science for policy, mm. not policy for science. Mm. Yep. But, but I will answer mm. um, some of that question, and so some of this is, is, is a personal view. Um, I said in answer to an earlier question, I absolutely, firmly, <coughs> passionately believe that there is a critical role for blue skies mm -hmm. undirected research. It's really important in the system. It's got to be uh, protected. And you're right, the ERC is seen as um, an important way in which that's, that's happened. So um, the government's position is that we'd like to fully associate with um, Horizon Europe going mm -hmm. forward. Um, and if that's possible and that looks like the right um, value for money approach, then that may answer that question. Mm -hmm. okay. If we don't fully associate and we can't be, uh, either because you know, the, the money doesn't work in terms of value for money in, the, in, in a deal situation or we don't have a deal and we end up, I'm clear that we need to have some way of making sure that, that side of the science system is funded. Mm -hmm. And whilst I think challenge-based funding is incredibly important mm -hmm. to drive certain things, 
it, isn't, it can't be the whole system. And one of the areas that I've been open about in, in, in several talks and, 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 and I remain of this view is that if I think back to, you know, I spent um, 11 years as head of R&D in, in, in an international pharmaceutical company uh, and I had a budget of about three billion pounds a year. And if I said to the board, thank you, I'm not going to tell you how much I'm going to spend on research, how much I'm going to spend on development, how much I'm going to spend on implementation, mm -hmm. they would have said, well, forget it. And I think as a nation, we need to ask ourselves, how much do we want to be spending on pure research? Mm -hmm. How much do we want to be spending on de more development type work? And how much do we want to be spending on implementation? And don't treat them as though they're the same things. I mean, the process you use to fund Blue Skies research is inevitably somewhat different, mm -hmm. very different actually, from the process you might want to fund a, a very late stage implementation linked to industry. And you know, I'm, I'm sure you can I was thinking about these mm -hmm. things, but I think that's a really important part yeah. of it. And, and I think if you define the percentages you want to spend, what you have in effect do is protect that research. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important part of what we need to do okay. going forward. Mm -hmm. Good. There's a lady in the middle here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Mindy Dooley, and I'm a policy advisor at the Royal Society of Chemistry. So my can't question quite, relates to- We can't to quite hear you, maybe. Oh, can, no, can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay, great. My question relates to um, the CSA's role in its capacity as head of the science and engineering profession within government. Um, and with EU exit, we will see um, a number of regulations, uh, you know, repatriated back to the UK. We'll be um, in a situation where we'll be regulating our own medical devices, chemicals, setting air quality thresholds, those sorts of things. So I wondered if you could comment on the challenge that that represents for the government science and engineering profession and the wider science and engineering community? Yeah, um, so I've got two priorities in, in, in my role. One I've defined as the science system in government, which is how do we get that as good as it can possibly be. And um, you know, science has been, I think, sometimes a bit peripheral to some of the government um, uh, machinery and um, I'm very determined to make it central in the way economics is to uh, government thinking. And so there's lots of things that we're doing at the moment to try and get that to be the case, including on the other side of like the policy side, making sure that the policy profession is adequately scientifically uh, knowledgeable to be good customers of science. So that's a sort of general comment. So that's one priority. The second priority is the projects we do in terms of making sure that we do things that are relevant, scientifically excellent, delivered on time in the right format. So there's the project bit and then there's the system. Now, you, you, you're right that um, there may be all sorts of regulation changes which we need to think very hard about. And it's been the case, I think, in, in Europe that the UK has influenced very heavily some of the approaches to regulations, particularly as it relates to things like risk versus hazard. So, you know, the UK is quite sophisticated in a risk-based approach, and some parts of Europe take a much more rigid hazard-based approach. You know, this is dangerous, therefore don't do it, even though actually when you do it in the right way, in the right amount, you know, it's absolutely fine. So I think there will be, there will be quite a few things where we need to look at that, and, um, uh, and there may well be areas where we, we, we need to think quite hard about what we want the regulations to be in the UK uh, going forward and what that means in terms of our ability to interact. So this is a complicated area. Uh, I think lots of people in Europe are a bit worried that the loss of the UK input to these sorts of discussions will drive them into a slightly more hazard-based approach. Um, lots of civil servants are working very hard now and lots of them are scientists as well on, on no deal Brexit and planning for uh, what would happen and what the regulations are that need to change. So big implications, I think. And of course, lots of time will be taken up with that that won't be spent on something else. Okay. Did you have one? Actually, could we, maybe, I, I, I'm worried I've been neglecting this side of the room, so there's a question here. And then. If, um, if one formulates three drivers for investment in science or doing science, one driver being military, another driver being the quality of life, improving health, etc. And the third driver is curiosity, 
which you would call the blue skies. Have you got an input into the balance between those three, or is that just purely a political decision? Well, I, as I think I was alluding to in my uh, earlier answer, I don't think we've had that national debate. I, 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 we don't actually have a way at the moment of defining how much we think should be on curi pure curiosity research versus more applied research. It's evolved. And my question is, has it evolved in the right place? Are we in the right place for a country like this with the science base we've got, the economy we've got, the uh, society we've got? Is it where we mean it to be? I think it's a bit clearer on, on the military and security side of things. I think there is, a, there is a political decision there about how much to spend. But that's more at a macro level of military spend. Again, for science, it's not as clear as it could be. So I think there is a, um, a whole question there about how we have that debate and, how we, and whether we want to have that debate or whether we're happy just to sort of allow it to evolve as it currently is and say, okay, that, that's good enough. So I, I, I think that's an important question. It's an important error, and it's one that I've been, uh, and others have been thinking about quite hard. Um, and um, I think UKRI are thinking about it as well. Okay. So I think Nick wanted to follow up on that. Maybe we could just switch you, turn you on. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, it's fine. No, it's all right. You're going to have... I, I agree. I think it is a very interesting question uh, in terms of the amount that we do spend on fundamental frontier research. But uh, I would have thought that actually you're in a leading position to take that debate forward and actually answer it. You know, so is it interesting to note that it's an interesting question? Uh, the next step is to is to do something about that question. So do you, is that something that you're actively pursuing and sort of? Who are the other main well, actors around so again, that will help you, you with that? You, you know, my job is not policy for science, but this is a critical question, and yes, I am working on it, and yes, I've had discussions with the UK on it, and yes, I've got some thoughts through the Council for Science and Technology and others as to, as, to, as to how we might try and get to settling that question. I think it's a fundamental question, and I think it's important, as I've said, not just because... You know, it's an intellectual exercise to know it, but actually it protects curiosity-driven research and it allows you to have the right mechanisms to fund more practical research, more, more task-orientated research. And I think we've got to be careful not to end up with a system that thinks that one approach can deal with all of that. Um, you know, mm. If you're sitting in either a startup company or a SME or a big company, a grant system isn't attractive. You know, you don't necessarily want to have um, a 40-page grant form, peer review for nine months, followed by somebody telling you how you should do something differently from what you were planning on doing in the first place. That isn't how it works in that system. So we need to get the right systems. And I think, you know, UKRI is really trying to do that. But, I, I, you know, yes is the answer. I'm, this is something that, 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 that I really want to push on, and I'm having discussions with people about how we, how we think that through. But it's not my, my job to do it, but I certainly have, a, have an opinion and, and, a, and a, a way of feeding into that. Good. Hello, I'm a medical student, um, and I just have a question about the division of local authority and higher level government, um, and whether you need to have like scientific understanding kind of transferred into a more usable way for local authorities. So if you take like air pollution, for example, um, and local authorities can't really use the massive numbers that DEFRA generates to advise their, their policy making because they take into account so many different things. And what local authorities need is something direct, like the actual healthcare costs saved. And otherwise, they just kind of ignore them. So do we need more understanding kind of translated into a more usable way? That's the question. Thanks. Well, I think it partly goes back to what the mayor was saying earlier on about actually getting some, some numbers and approaches to say what you could do at a local level. So I think that's a central task to sort of start outline what can be done um, and to put that in scientific terms. I think there's a secondary question, though, which is many of the problems that, uh, and opportunities that um, areas are going to face are 
local as well as national or international. And um, I think there's a very interesting question about whether more cities, for example, should have chief scientific advisors. And th that seems to me something really worth, worth pursuing. Um, only one city at the moment has um, a chief scientific advisor. I think that's Portsmouth. Southampton. Southampton, thank you. <laughs> I'm really crucified now for mixing them up. Um, and, um, and London has some advisors who come in, and you can see it actually in some of the sort of um, approach to air, air quality and so on. But I think there's, an, there's a case to be made for um, not every city, but, but bigger cities having a chief scientific advisor mm -hmm. and then making that a network to allow some of the things that you're talking about. Okay, so I think this might be our last question. Make it a good one. No pressure. In the middle here, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Marcus Shepherd from the Institute for Government. Um, we're about one year into Sir Mark Sedwell's fusion doctrine. I was just wondering if you had any experience of the fusion doctrine working groups, how open they are to scientific advice, and whether they represent a good model for thinking strategically around policy issues across government, particularly thinking about things like climate change. Thank you. So for those who don't know, um, Mark Sedwell, the Cabinet Secretary, is, is um, when he was as he still is, National Security Advisor, but in the security space, he introduced what he called the fusion doctrine, which was about you know, problems don't exist in one silo. You have to actually bring things together to try and tackle the problem, which I think is an absolutely good principle. He's now introducing that across the civil service and uh, looking at several different themes. So things like inclusiveness might be one thing. How do all policies come together and impact on inclusiveness? Um, uh, prosperity, another one, and so on. So it's a way to try and get Whitehall thinking across departments. Now, um, it, it, what's absolutely clear is that science runs through all of that. I mean, it, it is an, a unifying theme that goes through it. Um, Mark Sebel is very clear that science runs through it. Um, we are working as to what that means in practice, how we get that to happen. Science is one of those things, and my job is one of those unusual jobs in government that sits across departments. I don't sit in a department in the way that others do. And cross-government working is not easy, because legally and structurally, um, departments report up to a minister, and that minister has accountability for that area. So the system isn't designed to make that easy, but it's essential. And um, I think, you know, Mark's been uh, spearheading the fusion doctrine. There are working groups set up to try and work out what that means in practice. How do you start working on that? And science is embedded in that process and is, is actually fundamental to okay. it. So just, just before we wrap up, I think, you know, we, we're sitting here in an academic institution and I, we would, all of us, like to know what can academic individuals and academic community do better to give you either better evidence or better presented evidence to help, I guess, the CSAs and government in general? Well, um, I think most of the information that comes into advice, science advice mm. to government comes from academia. Um, now, just to be transparent, I'd quite like more of it to come from industrial science as well because, and I'll give you a specific example, uh, the drones issue around uh, Gatwick just before Christmas. Um, it's pretty clear that lots of the expertise and scientific knowledge sits in technical mm -hmm. groups inside industry, so we've got to get them in as well. But academics are crucial to science advice into government. What isn't helpful is, um, you know, a single piece of work lobbying. That, that's not science mm -hmm. advice, that's science lobbying, which mm -hmm. is a different thing. What is helpful is people who can think broadly across areas and bring advice in um, understanding that it's advice and that there's a decision that somebody needs to make at the end of it. So can you frame the advice in terms of the decision that needs to be made? And what's helpful is um, evidence synthesis to bring together pieces of work to say this is the body of knowledge that happens, which can happen systematically or it can happen as part of um, a science advisory group or a, a round table. And I think, you know, the more um, scientists can get involved in this, the better the advice to government becomes. And I, I gave a, a talk about um, the need to get better science in, inside government the other day, and a young person asked, what well, I thought it was a totally brilliant question. He said, because I was comparing science and, and what's happened to economics, and he said, well, of course, there's a degree called PPE, and there isn't a degree called PPS. Mm -hmm. 
I thought, that's a really interesting mm -hmm. observation, actually. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think there's something about making sure that um, uh, as scientists, we understand what it is that policymakers need and tailor our offering to that. And, and that requires people to get experience, it requires people to come and work inside government, it requires exchange between people, and it requires universities, as they are doing, as this one is doing, to uh, bring people together in a way that, that you can have that debate inside a university as well and make sure that there's a process to get the evidence presented in the right way. Okay, thank you. Right, so now the uh, next part of the evening is going to be this way to the foyer, contrary to Nick's earlier advice, um, <laughs> and um, where we'll have some drinks and the formal launch of the forum, but I would just like everyone to join me in thanking our um, guests.